Um, just before I get started, I just want a quick show of hands. How many people in the room have diabetes? And of those people, how many have been told that they have chronic kidney disease? How many are on either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis? And how many at one point or another have had a kidney transplant? OK, thank you very much. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is I have about a half an hour. And um, this is the most prevalent form of kidney disease in the United States and in the world. And so I don't think half an hour will totally do it justice. But I'd like to touch on some basic concepts about um, how diabetes affects the kidney, what exactly happens to the kidney when you have diabetes and you have diabetic kidney disease. And then a little bit later on, I just want to briefly touch on the issues related to kidney transplantation when you have diabetes. This is a very informal forum, so if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and don't be afraid to interrupt me. We're here for um, you guys. We're not here for me to get through the talk. So um, without further ado, um, just some general points um, that we're going to cover today. I wanted to touch on um, referral to nephrology clinic and what exactly happens when a patient with diabetes and kidney disease shows up in nephrology clinic, uh, which is the case in about 50% of patients. Um, then I'm going to touch on the history, the natural history of the disease, diabetic kidney disease, and what happens up to the point of kidney failure and before starting hemodialysis. And then, I, as I said earlier, I'll just touch on diabetes and kidney transplantation at the end. I wanted to start with a very basic question. Um, I didn't know how, how involved all of you are in kidney disease. And so this is a question that comes up all the time when I see a patient in nephrology clinic, because they have no idea who I am. My mother-in-law has no idea who I am. She thought I was a morphologist. <laughs> and um, so I just wanted to pr just start with some basic definitions. Um, of these, these are all of the things I've heard people say when they ask what a nephrologist does. Um, they've been told that they may or may not be a kidney doctor, uh, that they work in a renal clinic, which is a totally different word from the word kidney or nephrologist, um, that they may also be a urologist. Uh, and then they don't know what we've studied. So, the last uh, point is really what a nephrologist is. And a nephrologist is someone who's been trained in nephrology and hypertension. And I will explain what's meant by being trained in nephrology. Nephrology refers to any functional kidney disease. So if you can think of the kidney as a filtering organ, it filters the blood and cleans the blood. It does a lot of other things. But it's essentially bathed in the nutrients that bathe the rest of the body. And if something happens to one unit within the kidney, if that same thing happens to every other unit in the kidney, that's what we call a functional kidney problem. And that's the domain of nephrologists. It does not um, tread on the domain of urologists, for example, who are surgeons who deal with the kidney. But they don't deal with you folks. They don't deal with people who have diabetic kidney disease and who have kidney disease and kidney failure from other causes. Um, things like kidney stones and kidney cancer are not in the domain of the nephrologist. We mostly function on. We mostly concentrate on functional kidney diseases. And of course, diabetic kidney disease is a major, major, major part of what we do. Um, when Scott was doing the introduction, he said that I have an uh, interest and an expertise in diabetic kidney disease. That's not too hard, because 50% of the patients that any nephrologist in the United States or in the world sees is a patient with diabetes and kidney disease. It's very, very, very common. Um, another just basic definition exactly about what the kidney does and what happens when you have diabetes. What I've shown on here is a couple of figures. And uh, I have a point here, hopefully it'll work. The figure in the middle is just a kidney cut out, sliced from top to bottom down the middle, and, and opened up. And you can see that it, it has a very characteristic pattern to it. I won't go through what all of these compartments are. But if you start from the outward and work your way all the way down to the middle, there is about a million units, functioning units within the kidney. And each of those is called a nephron which is where the term nephrologist comes from. The blood filters through the nephron there. It gets processed all the way down and up and then down again through the nephron. And whatever is the output of that becomes a drop of urine. And if you have a million of these, that's how you make urine. And when you have diabetic kidney disease, or any other kidney disease for that matter, you have damage to every single one of these throughout the kidney. What happens at the very front of that? At the very, very front of that, um, this, is, this arrow is here to represent blood. So circulating blood that gets to the kidney comes into one of these functional units. And essentially, this is the filter. This is the first basic filter that the blood sees. 
it starts to clean the blood here, and then the blood that's um, remaining passes on to the next organ. So this is the very first part of how the kidney interfaces with the rest of the body. It's called the glomerulus, and I won't get into that uh, in too much detail, but that is essentially located on the periphery of the kidney. And all of the nephron units start with the glomerulus and work their way down to the end, which is in the middle. Another definition that I think is very important for this talk is CKD, or chronic kidney disease. This is a relatively new term um, that started about eight years ago. Before, there were terms like renal failure, chronic renal failure. Chronic kidney disease was sometimes thrown out there, end-stage kidney disease, end-stage renal failure, end-stage renal disease. All of those terms have some overlap, but the basic new term, which is going to be used by all doctors going forward, is something called CKD, which stands for chronic kidney disease. So what exactly does that mean? How do you define chronic kidney disease? Well, like everything in medicine, we like to digest it into small, easily understandable parts, which is that there are five stages, starting with stage one and progressing all the way down to stage five. Stage five is kidney failure, and it's time for dialysis. Stage one is very, very mild kidney disease. And at each of these stages, nephrologists have a certain range of how much the kidney is filtering, and also there are recommendations as to what, what are the most important issues for a patient with that stage of kidney disease. To give you an overall broad scope, if you have diabetes and you are being seen by a doctor who's treating your diabetes, who's either a specialist in diabetes like endocrinology or is an, inter an internist or a family medicine doctor, they are mostly dealing with patients with stage one or stage two kidney disease. The reason for that is that there is not too much problem um, from kidney damage of this, this mild amount of kidney damage. Once you get to stage three, that's when the National Kidney Foundation has recommended that you be referred to a nephrologist. And this is where, if you come to my clinic, this is where you are. You're at kidney disease stage three or four or five. And the reason that there's this artificial break between stage <laughs> two and three is because all of the other things that the kidney does, which I'll get into in a minute, start to break down at stage three. In other words, if you have kidney disease stage one and two, Sure, there are mild problems. If somebody were to do a biopsy of your kidney, they could detect very mild problems, but you would not feel it. You would not be asked to take any new medicine. You wouldn't have to do anything. But once you hit stage three, other things start to um, uh, become involved. Other processes in the body start to become involved, and the kidney starts to affect other processes in the body. So that is why this is really where we put all of our focus, chronic kidney disease stage three, four, and five. The last definition that I want to give you is DKD, which stands for diabetic kidney disease. In other words, having chronic kidney disease that is due to or caused by diabetes. This uh, term is a relatively new term. It's even younger than the term CKD. It's only been around for a couple of years. Um, the term that you might have heard before or that when you're searching on the internet for information about diabetes and kidney disease uh, is abbreviated DN. That stands for diabetic nephropathy which essentially refers to the same thing. These two terms, for the most part, are equivalent, with minor exceptions. In order to be diagnosed with diabetic kidney disease, you don't need a kidney biopsy. You just need a measure of your kidney, how well it's filtering, and you need to have diabetes. And that's pretty much it. It's what we see in about 50% of our patients, but it's also the easiest thing to diagnose. This is not a disease that will be missed. This is a disease that is once you have it, there are things that need to be done, but it is not one of those diseases that you will miss. Last definition. This is a term UAE, which stands for urinary albumin excretion. This is a term meant to talk about what happens when you get, give a urine sample and they measure the protein content, and then what that means for the definition of chronic kidney disease. So there are, like with anything, we have three stages of um, protein excretion in the kidney. There's normal, microalbuminuria, and macroalbuminuria. These terms are not so important. It's just important to know that it's not normal to have protein in your urine. That is not a normal thing. The kidney is a very good filtering unit and it doesn't normally filter protein. If there's protein that's getting into the urine, that means that there's something wrong with the filter. At the very top, at the very periphery of the kidney, there's some damage there and protein is spilling into the urine. That is a marker of disease, and that's what we measure to know very, very subtle changes um, in, in kidney problems. There are different grades of 
of um, damage and different grades of protein in the urine, starting with if it's less than a certain amount, that's considered normal. If you're within the range 30 to 300 on a particular test, that's considered microalbuminuria, which is actual damage, but it's not that much protein in the urine. Once you get to the point of having about more than 300 um, on this test, that's when you formally have diabetic kidney disease. So I don't want to go into the details of this too much, but just to know that this is what a nephrologist will measure, or an internist or a diabetes doctor will measure in order to assess whether someone with diabetes will be developing kidney disease. This is the first clue. I wanted to touch on some public health issues related to diabetic kidney disease. I, I don't know if these blue numbers are coming through, so I'll just say what they are. So 7% of the United States population has diabetes. That's about, um, I don't know, I have to do some quick math, but that's somewhere around 10 or 11 million, I believe. Um, about 95% of those people have type 2 diabetes. Only about 5% have type 1. So this is much more a prevalent disorder for type 2 patients simply because there are more of you. Now let's look at how many people in the country have chronic kidney disease. It's about 11%, which is enormous. It's actually more than diabetes. Chronic kidney disease does not make it to the, does not make it to CNN. Anderson Cooper doesn't talk about it. Oprah doesn't talk about it. They talk about diabetes. Diabetes is much more visible um, in the in the mainstream media. But chronic kidney disease is extremely common, and it's much it's much um, less. It's 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 not as diagnosed as often because of the fact that you need a blood test or a urine test, and your doctor has to tell you you have chronic kidney disease and you don't feel anything. Whereas with diabetes, most people at the time of diagnosis feel something. And so it's much more common for somebody to come in to a clinic and have symptoms and then be diagnosed with diabetes, as opposed to chronic kidney disease where people could have symptoms for a very long time, up until stage three, and have no measurable problem whatsoever until you check a blood test or a urine test, and then you can tell that you have chronic kidney disease. But it's very, very common. To give you a sense of what happens to patients who have chronic kidney disease, only about 1% of all those people actually make it to dialysis. That's a very, very, it seems like a very small number, but it turns out that because of the fact that chronic kidney disease is so common, there's about 300,000 patients in the United States who are on dialysis at any one time. But it is a small, small, small fraction of the total population that has some form of chronic kidney disease. Sorry. This is a disease that we're going to be hearing a lot more about in the next 10 to 20 years. Simply, if you just look at this blue curve right here, this blue curve refers to the number of patients with uh, end-stage kidney failure, just that 1%, but still a lot of people. And how many of those people have end-stage kidney failure due to diabetes versus due to other causes, which are these other three bars. And it's, it's plotted by time. So on this, on this curve, this is from 1980, every four years until 2004, these numbers are tabulated by the United States renal data system, and um, it's publicly available. And diabetic nephropathy, or diabetic kidney disease, is the main cause, number one, and it's also growing at an enormous rate. This is the same plot. It looks very parallel. It's because this is simply the rate. So this is the absolute value of numbers of patients. This is just the rate um, per all the patients on, on dialysis. Just to emphasize once again that I said that people who make it to end-stage renal disease is only 1% of all the patients with chronic kidney disease. Even more so, of all the patients that have diabetes, only about 5 to 10% actually go on to develop diabetic nephropathy. It's not that common among all the diabetics who are out there. But for those who do get it, it is a very serious disease because it progresses very fast and we don't have very good therapies at this time. So although I think you're getting the message that I'm saying that this is a very rare circumstance that this occurs, that these two um, circumstances occur. But because there are so many people with both of these very common diseases, there are so many people that actually get to this point where they have chronic kidney disease yes. due to diabetes. I have a question. Yes? Uh, what kind of blood test will determine if a person has CKD or not? Or you require a urine test also or both? Right, so I'll get into that in just a moment. Yes. Oh, so this, the second one is hypertension. This, this one, can you see my pointer? Yes. It's that one. And then the guideline is 
The dark line is something called glomerular nephritis, which refers to all of the really rare diseases that are due to some inflammatory disorder in the body that cause a problem with the glomerulus so their filtration unit and then lead to kidney failure. So um, even though these are the ones that are, that, um, at least in the hospital anyway, are ones that are they're much more rare, um, there's a lot more that goes into the diagnosis of, of these types of patients with this disorder because it's much more difficult to diagnose. Diabetes and hypertension comparatively for a physician is easy. And so even though we can diagnose it early, it's so prevalent that, the, that we haven't been able to make very many inroads in the disease. I wanted to spend a moment on cardiovascular risk to give you guys a sense of what this disease means and what we're dealing with. About um, 10, 15 years ago, um, when people, when we were in training and uh, we were told to monitor for cholesterol in patients, Cholesterol is very important. You want to monitor for cholesterol because if you have a high cholesterol, you're at risk for having what's called a cardiovascular event, which usually broadly refers to either having a heart attack, a stroke, or a clot in the, in the blood, I mean, a, a blood clot in the leg, for example. So that's what's referred to as a cardiovascular event. And nowadays, if you have a high cholesterol, you are in a certain risk group for having one of those events. If you have diabetes, you could have a totally normal cholesterol and be in the exact same risk group because diabetes in and of itself leads to cardiovascular events. Chronic kidney disease is just like diabetes. Chronic kidney disease in and of itself is a risk factor for a cardiovascular event. Like I said, totally normal cholesterol. You're still at risk for a, um, an event. And if you put the two together, they are actually not just additive, but it's actually synergistic. So if you, have, um, if you have diabetes and you have just a little bit of protein in your urine, which is the most subtle form of chronic kidney disease, you are at about two-fold risk of having a cardiovascular event versus if you had diabetes and no kidney problem whatsoever. So it is a major part of what we do when we see patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease in the clinic because this is going to be much more of an important issue before the initiation of dialysis, because only about 1% of the patients actually make it to dialysis. But many, many more patients have to deal with the burden of having a heart attack, stroke, or peripheral arterial disease. So I'm going to do a little bit of animation on this slide. And it's really, I'm going to be bringing in a lot of uh, histology terms. But the important part of this, I want to give you guys a sense of how fast this disease progresses. Yes. That's an excellent, excellent question. To be honest, we don't really know. Most people um, who get a very little bit of protein in their urine, um, mo so that's a, that's, a, that's a small group to begin with. Some of those people will move on to develop um, more protein in the urine, and then, and this will I'll get to in the slide in a sec, and then some of those people will go on to develop problems with their filtration, kidney failure, and go on to dialysis. But some people will just stay put at just a little bit of protein in the urine, not ever have a problem with their filtration function, not ever have any of the other problems you have to see a nephrologist for. Um, and then other people will actually get better if their diabetes gets better. And other people will suffer from a cardiovascular event that is very debilitating or life-threatening before they ever get to the point of being a dialysis patient. So this uh, timeline that I'm about to go through sort of illustrates that a little bit. So what I have here is just a very broad timeline. And we're going to define year zero as the diagnosis of diabetes. For type 1 patients, that is actually the time of the onset of the disease. Because you know when you become a diabetic when you're a kid. Any, anybody here who's a type 1 diabetic will tell you they knew the day that they became a diabetic. For type 2 diabetes, it's a bit of a different story. Type 2 diabetics typically have the disease for about 5 to 10 years before they know and before they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, simply because the first few years, generally one does not have any symptoms. And when you're at this point of year zero, you have no kidney problems from diabetes. There's nothing going on in your kidney. Even for the next five to 10 years, the kidney function, amazingly enough, is actually better than normal for the first five to 10 years. It's still not known exactly why this happens and whether this happens to everybody. But we think this is because of, um, I guess, the best way to, to think about it is a sugar rush. The kidney um, is essentially trying to sense and deal with a very high 
sugar in the blood, and it's essentially hyperfiltering. So it's working overtime. Turns out that working overtime actually makes it poop out faster later down the line. But for the first five to 10 years, there's actually no problem, and your kidney's actually working in overdrive better than normal. People have done this. They have done a kidney biopsy on people with, at this stage, so that they've had diabetes for about five to 10 years. The kidney biopsy looks totally, totally normal. Nothing absolutely wrong. Oh, sorry. So then, and I just wanted to show here um, one of those glomerulus, glomeruli on the screen just, just for your reference. Think of blood is coming in here into the filter, and then the blood that's, that's not, and then that's filtered goes out here to go onto the rest of the body. Any of the filtrate, the part that gets into the kidney for processing, is in this sort of empty space in between this glomerulus and this nephron. And then this, um, the, the urine here, the filtrate, will go and travel down the, down the nephron, one of those million functional units, and get processed and eventually become urine at the end. And it's this part of the kidney that is damaged with high glucose, primarily, in the beginning. And so I just wanted to have this up there for reference. Like I said, a biopsy at this point in time, totally normal. Another way of looking at that is um, this is just a schematic of, of one of those filtration units. And um, I just have to have this up there for the reference of the slide. I'm not going to go through any of the details of what exactly these, these abbreviations mean. But let's go through what happens over time. So you've had diabetes for five to 10 years. Your kidney's in overdrive. Then what happens after about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, the filtration function comes back down to normal. And as doctors, we actually view this as, as disease, that it's, it's working at a certain level, and then it, for some reason, uh, tires out, and your fu filtration function comes back down to normal. If this is when you're seeing a doctor, then, then no one, you have no knowledge that any of this overworking in the beginning even happened. Because if you measure the filtration function of the kidney right here, it's totally the same as it was when you were 10 or 20 years old. And so, but if you were to biopsy patients, and people have gone through this, they've been biopsied even though they have nothing detectably wrong, just for research purposes, you start to see damage in the glomerulus. So this is when you first pick up the effects of diabetes in the kidney. Nobody feels anything at this point, but the disease is starting very early on. Gradually what happens is more progressive changes on kidney biopsies happen after that time for the next 10 to 20 years. And eventually, way down the line, 20 years after you've had diabetes, is when you'll start to see a first hint of a slight amount of protein in the urine. And once that happens, everything gradually gets worse from that point. Um, the amount of protein in the urine will increase over time, and eventually you will start to get, you will start to get a drop off. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not showing up on your screen. You'll start to get a drop off in the filtration function and you'll start to enter chronic kidney disease stage three, then four, then five. So on a timeline of the whole entire disease, the nephrologist is involved, and really the patient is involved, for only a minor fraction of that. The disease has been occurring for a very long time. And what people who are doing research in this area are actively trying to do is figure out how we can, how we can detect the disease much, much earlier, and also stop the disease much, much earlier. So as I said, it's a very, Easy, easy disease to diagnose at this point. But by this point, a lot of damage to the kidney has already happened, and it, it inexorably progresses from that point forward to the point of dialysis. I wanted to provide two anecdotes about diabetic kidney disease to illustrate a couple of points. Um, this term, KW nodules, uh, here is a biopsy from a patient with end-stage kidney disease. There are these big pink areas on here. It's not important that you see, but just trust me that there are these big pink areas on here called Kimmelsteel Wilson nodules, named for the two doctors in the 40s who discovered them. And, um, or actually in the 30s, I'm sorry, that discovered them. And this was a patient that was actually presented in a medical journal in the 70s um, that I think is very in interesting and really illustrates how this disease works. A patient came into a hospital with rip roaring high blood pressure, 250 over 150, long before there was any antihypertensive medicines out there. He ended up dying of a cardiovascular event from a stroke or something from his high blood pressure. And he actually underwent an autopsy because at that time they didn't know why he died. Um, he had had diabetes for many years. It was undiagnosed. And on his, on his autopsy, they found that in front of his two kidneys, the artery that feeds the kidney on one side was completely clotted off. And on the other side, it was totally open. And 
when they then looked at the kidney, and this is a person who's had diabetes that both kidneys are presumably exposed to for 20 to 30 years. When they looked at the kidney, the kidney that was protected, in other words, that was after that clot, that didn't see any of the high blood pressure, just had very minor changes but was otherwise totally normal. Whereas the kidney that was open to the world, so to speak, or open to the effects of the high blood pressure, had rip-roaring kid diabetic kidney disease in these chemosteel wilson nodules. And it just really goes to show this point at the bottom that I want to, I want to hone in on, which is that blood pressure control is a key element of stopping the progression of diabetic kidney disease. Your nephrologist, when you see one, will and should highlight this point tremendously. And this is, is an experiment of nature that just, that just um, shows it in another way. That controlling the blood pressure is very, very important from a very early stage of the disease. One can delay the disease, not cure it, but delay the disease significantly for years and years. And that can delay the onset of dialysis for years and years. Controlling the blood pressure is a very good thing for a lot of reasons. One of those reasons is to delay the progression of diabetic kidney disease. Question. Yes. It has the two lines, R and L. Yes. Is that beyond two kidneys? Yes, right and left, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, um, I wanted to briefly touch on the screening guidelines of the National Kidney Foundation. So you have a patient with diabetes. When do you check them? How often do you check them? How do you know or how do you easily diagnose this disease? So the screening guidelines are fairly, um, are fairly easy to remember. For type 1 diabetics, after they've had the disease for about five years, um, it's recommended that you check the urine for protein, blood pressure, and also how well the kidney is filtering. This can be diagnosed by a simple blood test. It's called the serum creatinine, which I'm sure all of you in this room, if you've had kidney disease, have had measured. Um, and then for type 2 diabetics, really from the time of diagnosis is, you want, is when you want to start measuring things like the protein in the urine, the blood pressure, and the serum creatinine. The reason that you start earlier for type 2 diabetics is simply because of the assumption that we all work under, which is that at the time you're diagnosed, you've probably had the disease for about five years. And so that's where these screening guidelines come from. Risk factors for progression of um, diabetic kidney disease to end-stage renal disease. These really refer to patients with type 2 diabetic kidney disease, which is about 95% of the patients. What I have listed on the left is modifiable risk factors. In other words, things that we can do something about versus non-modifiable risk factors that we can't do anything about that are, but are important to know, in other words, to um, prognosticate what will happen in the future. For modifiable risk factors, there's several, and these are the sort of the commandments of our treatments for diabetic kidney disease, is Poor glycemic control or poor sugar control, poor control of the diabetes, will make the disease progress faster. faster. A uncontrolled blood pressure, as I just illustrated in that case, is another thing that will make the disease progress faster. High cholesterol will make the disease progress faster, faster. If you end up having a lot of protein, and you can take medicines to reduce the protein, the more protein you have, the faster you will progress. And also, I think with like any disease that we know of, if you smoke, the disease will progress faster. These other non-modifiable risk factors refer to genetics. Um, if, the, if a parent has had hypertension, even if you don't, that's a risk factor. If you were um, born at a very low birth weight, uh, the thought per the Barker hypothesis is that you have fewer nephrons, and therefore you have fewer nephrons to hold out for before you start really progressing. Um, unfortunately, um, men progress faster than women, and for um, certain ethnicities, uh, you progress faster with diabetic kidney disease, that being African Americans, Hispanics, and also um, I bring up Pima Indians because it's a particular population of uh, Native Americans that live in the Arizona uh, Gila River community, but they've been studied for diabetic kidney disease for about 40 years by the National Institutes of Health, and so I put that up there because we know a lot about this population. Yes? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, third one down, the high birth. Yes, I'm sorry, that refers to high cholesterol or high triglycerides. And the, and the area, that's, uh, protein. that's protein in the urine. At, at, at what stage should a person uh, of the kidney disease, should a person uh, start really monitoring protein intake? So, um, let me, I'm just going to show that on the next slide. And I have a, um, if, you, if you have, if you bear with me, sir, it'll be on in a couple of slides. It's one of my last slides. But that's a very good question. Um, what I've said so far is pretty glum. So I wanted to bring up at least one slide on the reversibility of the disease. 
Um, is this disease reversible? Well, the thought is, uh, I do research in this, our thought is that hopefully we'll have a medicine that, yes, can reverse the disease, but I think diagnosing it earlier is a way, and, and preventing it from going forward is a, is a much more likely outcome. Um, although there is evidence in patients with type 1 diabetes and the disease that you can actually reverse, there's not that much evidence in patients with type 2, which is unfortunately 95% of the patients. Um, there was a paper that came out um, almost more than a decade ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a prominent medical journal, about a reversal of diabetic lesions. And I think I wanted to bring this up because I think it illustrates the point I was talking about about modifiable risk factors. These were eight patients that had type 1 diabetes and had very mild kidney problems. So they had a slight amount of protein in the urine, and their filtration function, or their serum creatinine, was totally normal. So they, for the most part, were not seeing a nephrologist. But they had really bad type 1 diabetes that was a problem to control the sugar and that was causing other problems with their health. These patients received a pancreas transplant, in other words, to get a new beta islet cells to cure their type 1 diabetes. Well, a, a certain subset of these patients actually got kidney biopsies along the way because somebody was curious what would happen. If you remember my timeline from before, if you have that slight amount of protein in the urine, you or I don't feel anything from that. But if you were to biopsy the kidney, there is already severe damage at that point. Well, in these patients, they wanted to see what would happen to that severe damage if you put in a brand new pancreas. In other words, your sugar control is perfect from that point on in your life. You have no diabetes. Can the disease reverse itself? The answer is yes, it can. At, at, the, at this initial time point, there was substantial disease on their kidney biopsies. And this was just one patient as an illustration. By about five years, there wasn't very much reversibility. The disease was still around. But when they biopsied people 10 years after their pancreas transplant, it showed regression of the lesions on the kidney biopsy. So I refer to this paper often because I do research in this disease. And I think it motivates me to try to find ways to control the sugar better earlier and also to find ways to reverse the lesions. Because the body has proven to us um, through these patients and illustrating it that the disease can reverse. Um, this slide is not showing up very well, and we're running short on time, so I'll be brief. In patients that have only a very mild amount of protein, um, the bottom line is that if you control those risk factors for progression, if you control blood pressure, if you control cholesterol, if you, control, if you take certain medicines for the blood pressure, specifically an ACE inhibitor, uh, which every, anything that ends in a PRIL or a Sartan is an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, if you take any of those medicines, about half of the patients that get to this point where there's a very mild amount of protein leaking into the urine can actually reverse to normal. So at a very early stage, there is some evidence of reversibility. This was a paper in type 1 diabetics, but the same has been shown for type 2, at least for this particular instance. So I guess my main message is that early diagnosis, early intervention is better than late diagnosis and no intervention. Treatment guidelines by the National Kidney Foundation. So what are the takeaway guidelines from all of this? And these refer to anybody with diabetes and chronic kidney disease at any stage, really, stage one through four. We try to keep the sugar control, and those of you in the room who have diabetes have probably seen an A1C or had an A1C measured. We try to keep that less than 7%. There is a parallel to that in terms of your blood sugar, which I won't get into now. We try to keep the blood pressure under 130 over 80, and we usually use either a pril or a sartan and a water pill in order to do that. We try to keep the, the bad cholesterol less than 100 because chronic kidney disease in and of itself is a risk factor for cardiovascular events. And the last point um, to the gentleman on the left is about protein. This is the recommended daily allowance of protein. And I think Connie's going to get into this a little bit more. Uh, it's recommended to take about 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day. One point about protein intake. For a very long time, it has been said that protein in the urine is bad. So what should we do about that? Maybe we should eat less protein, because then there'll be less protein in the urine. It turns out that it's not that simple, because protein is very important for nutrition. And having, being well nourished is probably better than having a little bit of protein in the urine. And the protein in the urine is more of a sign of what's going on, rather than a causal um, entity of the, the disease itself. And so even though the recommended protein intake is 0.8, it's not lower than that. And that still represents a substantial amount of protein. And I think it's, 
the National Kidney Foundation basically hedged their bets with this recommendation. They said, don't overdo it, don't take too much protein any more than you need to be well nourished, but certainly don't underdo it because you don't want to be undernourished. And especially if you're developing chronic kidney disease with all the other associated problems that, that comes with, undernourishment is worse than well nourishment, even if it means you have a little bit of protein in your urine. I have a question. Yes. That refers to any protein. There is not very good clinical studies to isolate that. This recommendation was a bunch of nephrology experts sitting around a poolside, and they came up with the number. So they, it, wasn't, it wasn't broken up in that way, and there's not that great evidence to say one way or the other um, which is better or worse. There are small studies in small groups of patients, but not hundreds of thousands of patients that have been studied for long periods of time to really have a definitive conclusion. Yes? This, this, refer, this is a term, um, I borrowed this from one of my other slides, hemoglobin A1c. This is essentially a blood test that you can get if you're a diabetic to look back in time at the past three months of your sugar control. And it's expressed as percent, um, but if it's less than seven, that means that for the past three months, you've had really good sugar control. Um, if you have, there's an equivalent for what your average sugar would have been every single day for the past three months. And I think seven, um, if I do the backhand calculation, is about 185, a sugar of 185 or less every day for the past three months. Yes? Sir. The bottom one, uh, the protein, uh, two questions on that. First, I think you said that was, that was 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight yes. per day? Yes, yes. Okay, and then I think you said that, it, it, that that's the norm, that you don't want to eat the less than that. That's correct. My point about protein is simply this, that there are many other things that are important for you and your doctor to control that have definitively been shown to slow the progression of the disease. I think protein is, is something that folks concentrate on because it's something that they can do something about that doesn't involve a pill or seeing a doctor. But I think the other things have a much more um, uh, profound effect on the progression of the disease that even though this is a controllable element in one's diet and a modifiable risk factor for that, I don't think it makes that much difference in terms of the progression of the disease. Taking your blood pressure medicine, stopping smoking, controlling your weight and your sugar and your cholesterol, I think are much, much, much more important than watching the protein. It's harder to do that. It's certainly harder to do that. Um, but I think it's much more important for the disease. Yes? And then I've, I've heard this Soy, like soy protein is not necessarily good because it has the phosphorus in it. Right. So there are, um, I, I must say that I am not an expert on nutritional elements of diabetic kidney disease, so I can't comment really further on that. I can tell you this, that there's not a large stu study that, that isolates the different types of proteins and says which ones are better or worse for a patient with this disorder. Oh, when I reduce my protein is that, um, do you have diabetic kidney disease, sir? Do you mind saying? Definitely. And when you say that it improves, do you, do you mean that your serum creatinine gets better? Right. Okay. Uh, let me talk to you afterwards, because there's some other complexities that are involved with it that I have to ask you that I don't want to ask in a public forum. But that's interesting. Thank you. Sir. Yes? Mm -hmm. there is a right, and that's definitely true. There's definitely a correlation between how much protein you take in and how much protein will be in the urine. But what is not totally correlative is whether that reduction in protein in the urine by way of reducing the protein intake is the same as reducing the protein, intake, reducing the protein in the urine from taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, which, has a very, which reduces the protein in the urine by a very different mechanism, which is actually has an effect on the kidney. And so even though there is a reduction of the protein in the urine, that does not necessarily translate into a slowing down of the disease. Oh, that was going to be my, my question. And yet, if I consume uh, fruit, there is an awful lot of, right. of bubbles under the urine. Right. Stand here. Stand here. Stand here. Stand here. Okay. Uh, what, what she said was that if she, re if she reduces the protein in her diet, for example, by taking vegetables, she sees less protein in the urine. Uh, on the flip side of that, if she takes a lot of fruit, there's a lot more protein in the urine. What I'm saying is that 
another way to reduce protein in the urine is by taking a medicine, which is much, it's much um, uh, less satisfactory of a solution. But the reason these medicines are so, so, um, uh, so important for our armamentarium for treating the disease is they reduce the protein by a very different mechanism. They essentially calm down the kidney and they slow the filtration through the kidney and they slow the damage. So you see less protein even if you were taking the same amount of protein in your diet. But that slowing down of the disease actually slows down the disease overall over years. Whereas if you just simply reduce the protein in the diet, yes, you reduce the protein in the urine, but it doesn't necessarily improve the disease any. Yes? Is um, that progression that you're speaking of? Yes. Uh, it's somewhat, correct me if I'm wrong, it's somewhat linear in the early stages and then it becomes exponential? Yes. Towards three, four, five? Yes. Could you comment about what yes, that means? Yes, I can. There? So the question was that in the early part of the disease of diabetic kidney disease, there's a certain amount of protein in the urine and it's very linear over time and it gradually will progress. And early on, when you have kidney problems, when your serum creatinine gets worse, in other words, your filtration starts to go down, it's a linear process initially. And then at some point, it's kind of like falling off a cliff. You exponentially get worse, and you approach quickly dialysis. So the comment that I have is that um, each of the nephrons has the capacity to overwork. In other words, to compensate for the nephrons around it. So if you were to lose the function of one nephron, then another nephron, or, and the, the best example of that is somebody who donates their kidney for, uh, for their friend or relative for a transplantation. Um, you check them five years later, they have a totally normal serum creatinine, right? Even though they've lost half of their nephrons because they donated one of their kidneys. It's because the nephrons, they step up to the plate and they, um, they overfilter and they, they reduce the serum creatinine and, they, and they, they get the filtration function back to normal. Eventually, and this doesn't happen in the lifetime of a uh, patient who donates a kidney because they're healthy. But eventually in the lifetime of a patient with diabetes, if you have an event that you lose a nephron or two, and other nephrons have to take over the reins, then when they poop out, you really start to see it quickly. And it's, 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 a, um, it's an exponential worsening of the filtration function from that point. Because a, a serum creatinine, and those of you who had it measured know what I mean when I say if you have a serum creatinine of 1.2, that's slightly worse than normal, and that represents a certain degree of um, lowered filtration. Um, if you, that serum creatinine would be a lot worse if your, other, if your nephrons, half of your nephrons weren't over filtering to keep the serum creatinine that low. And once some of those other nephrons that have been keeping, it, keeping the kidney going for so long, and they start to get damaged and start to drop off, then that number rapidly rises. So that's, I think, where this transition from linearity to exponentiality occurs. It's from the filtration. Yes? Hi. This might be slightly off topic, but I'm just, I've never heard uh, this, the term over-filtering before. As a transplant recipient, aside from all the other things that can go wrong when you receive a transplant, does the kidney that you receive go into a state of over-filtering just by virtue of the fact that you're living on one kidney? Um, so the question was that um, if you have kidney failure and both your kidneys are damaged and you receive a kidney transplant, then that one kidney is the only working kidney in your body. And is it essentially over-filtering to compensate for only having one kidney, as opposed to a normal healthy person that has two? And the answer is yes. You're, that, that kidney does have to over-filter because it has to take the place of the two that you had when you were younger. But um, because that kidney is coming from someone who's presumably totally healthy and has a totally normal kidney, the, that kidney will not um, get damaged from that over-filtering over the lifetime of the transplant recipient. Because it's such a, essentially if you're getting a young kidney when you're older, then you're not gonna see the effects of that overfiltering in your lifetime. And so that's why it's not a clinical issue at that point. When it becomes a clinical issue is if you have another problem with your kidney and your body needs to compensate and it can't because of all this overfiltering. That's what happens in a diabetic who has kidneys. Could you go back to that once the slide previous to this for just a moment? Yes. Um, the slide just previous. Oh. Oh, oh, I see. Got it. Thank you. So these are the treatment guidelines, and I essentially ordered them the same as those modifiable risk factors. For poor glycemic control, there's a certain recommendation for how low your doctor wants your sugar to be. For blood pressure, there's a recommendation as to how low we want your blood pressure to be and, use, and using what medicines to get your blood pressure that low. For cholesterol, how low we want the bad cholesterol to be. For 
proteinuria, there's both a reduction in protein to a, a modest reduction, not too much, but a modest reduction. Um, just making sure that you don't over ingest protein. And the one after that was being on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB to reduce the protein. And the last two recommendations were maintaining your weight um, and also uh, stopping smoking. Yes. So uh, thank you for your presentation today. So I've been a type 1 diabetic for 17 years. And I fall into that timeline where uh, in recent years, I've been told that I'm uh, weak in protein in my urine. And uh, so I've asked my doctor what I can do to help that situation out. My numbers have come down recently um, through diet, exercise. I take Lisinopro uh, each day. However, um, is what I'm hearing that even though the, that number of the protein in my urine is decreasing, that the damage to my kidney is still inevitable and the disease will continue to progress. I'm just basically slowing it down. Right. Is that correct? Right. So let me just paraphrase the question. The question is for a type 1 diabetic who's had type 1 diabetes for more than a decade, who's now developing, you've now developed a slight amount of protein in the urine, taking an ACE inhibitor to reduce that protein, what effect does that have on the overall outcome of the disease progressing to end stage renal disease? Um, so if you take an ACE inhibitor to reduce your protein, uh, you are essentially slowing down the disease. There are a fraction of patients where if you take an ACE inhibitor to reduce your protein, you actually truly reverse the disease to the point that it's not, um, you're not, you haven't just slowed it down, you've essentially cured yourself. And those are the patients on a slide that I showed earlier. If you have a very slight amount of protein, if you fall into that range of microalbuminuria, then if you take an ACE inhibitor, if you control your blood pressure, if you control your cholesterol, about half of the people in that category, which means that the other half we don't know what's going on, it's, we don't understand the disease that well, but about half of the people can regress from a little bit of protein in the urine to no protein in the urine. I consider that clinical cure, because if you have diabetes and there's nothing detectably wrong that a doctor can test for with your kidney, you don't have a kidney problem, right? That I consider a clinical cure. But if you have macroalbuminuria, in other words, a lot of protein, and you reduce it to a little bit of protein, not to zero, but to a little bit of protein that's still detectable, then you have done what you can to slow the disease tremendously, but it will still progress. Will it progress in your lifetime is the question. In other words, will you have chronic kidney disease and never live to get to dialysis? Which is frankly a, I mean, if you can do that, then you've slowed the disease to a meaningful outcome because you haven't gotten to dialysis. But um, it does not cure the disease. So the answer to your question is, at what level of protein reduction are you talking about? Are you going from a little to nothing, in which case, yes, you're curing? Or if you're going from a lot to a little, you're not curing, you're just tremendously slowing it down. Sure. Yes? Is dialysis ever used to give the kidney a rest? So the question was, is dialysis? Right. Is dialysis ever used to give the kidney a rest? And that's actually a fascinating question. I've never thought of that. Um, as far as I know, no. Uh, it is only used to give the kidney a rest in very isolated, severe cases when someone is in the intensive care unit and has kidney failure and the body needs to recover and repair the kidney. Then something needs to take the place of what the kidney was supposed to do. Um, that's the only circumstance where that comes up. But for someone in a chronic state where this is going on over years, no. Yes? How do you monitor uh, the amount of protein on standardized tests of blood in the urine? Right, so the question was how do you monitor uh, proteinuria or protein in the urine? Uh, the most typical test that we do is called an albumin to creatinine ratio. So it's a simple urine test that is a, just, you can pee into a cup and give it. It can also be done in more sophisticated testing where you, you collect your urine for a certain amount of time, let's say four hours or 12 hours or 24 hours. And for each, depending on how you do it, there's a certain range for this is normal, this is a little bit of protein, this is a lot of protein. And there's an equivalent chart that you can come up with. The most common way we do it is simply the albumin creatinine ratio because you can just give a spot sample in the lab and then they can measure that. So it's really a matter of how much albumin there is in the urine relative to the amount of creatinine in the urine. And those are spelled out as a line item in your urine analysis results? Absolutely, yes. 
So as an example, the albumin creatinine ratio is less than 30 milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine, that's normal. If you're between 30 and 300, that's microalbuminuria. If you're greater than 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine, that's macroalbuminuria. So that is, as kidney, as kidney doctors, we can't biopsy everybody. And we don't biopsy everybody for a variety of reasons. But the measuring of the filtration function, the serum creatinine, and the measuring of the protein in the urine are the two things that are, are our windows into what the kidney is doing. And for most patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, you will probably have both of those tests every time you see a nephrologist. When I look at the report, it's easy to see that as what I'm now tracking, which is CFE. GFE. Yeah, GFR. GFR, yeah. Yes, it is just as easy to see that. Right. 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 And unlike the GFR, you're tracking GFR based on a serum creatinine that is then undergoes a very complex equation to estimate for your age and weight and race. Um, what your GFR probably is. But the albumin in the urine is a definitive absolute value number that there's no estimation for. It's a number that we can, that we can track. So it's much more objective. The GFR is fairly accurate, but there are some slight issues with it. Thank you. What yes. Does obesity play in so excellent question. The, the question was, what role does obesity play in DKD? So obesity is thought to, in, to worsen the progression of diabetic kidney disease. That's why one of the final recommendations of the National Kidney Foundation is to control um, your weight. And the number that they give to that is a body mass index of between 18 and 25, which is considered normal. And um, there's a lot of reasons why we think obesity is related to diabetic kidney disease, uh, which I won't get into here. But yes, it, it, it is thought to play a role. Basically, for diabetic kidney disease, it is a systemic disorder of diabetes that oftentimes comes with other things. It comes with high cholesterol, it comes with obesity, it comes with high blood pressure, and it comes with diabetes. And so the kidney disease is really a, um, a processing of all of that. And so we like to think of it as a multi five-step intervention where you hit each of those problems all at once. And then you can make some inroads in slowing down the progression of the disease. I think I'm... Oops, one last question. Does somebody have a renal recovery even after many months on hemodialysis? Uh, is it possible to have the function recovered a little? Right. So, so the, or, or because the dialysis is not giving the kidneys a natural way to work, when it impairs the uh, recovery? Right. Dialysis so, so the question is, what effect is dialysis, hemodialysis as a treatment modality, have on the, the uh, lifetime of the kidney and will it actually make it worse or make it better? So the answer is that hemodialysis will not have any effect on the, on the lifetime of the kidney. If you have diabetic kidney disease and you have damage to the point that your kidneys have failed and you're on dialysis, dialysis will have no effect on whether your kidney recovers or not. Your kidney will not recover. So dialysis will not um, help or hurt that. There are some very rare cases which show up on medical TV shows of people with kidney disease that can recover after someone has to start hemodialysis. Diabetic kidney disease is not one of those rare cases. It does not recover. It is a progressive, irreversible disorder after a certain point. Sure. Um, so the question was, does peritoneal, per, peritoneal dialysis slow the progression of the kidney disease? Um, that I would have to disagree with. Peritoneal dialysis is often used for patients that A, want to be able to do dialysis at home, but B, it's almost exclusively used in patients that have some element of their own kidney function remaining. Because the peritoneal dialysis, even though you have to do it every day, it's not as effective as hemodialysis. And so, you know, your body depends on that little bit of kidney function that you still have remaining. Um, it can, it can uh, if you have a little bit of kidney function remaining and you start on hemodialysis, you will eventually over time lose that little bit of kidney function. Now whether that happens because the hemodialysis did that or because just generally over time you go from a filtration of very poor to nothing is still a question. So it's not that the peritoneal dialysis is better for the kidney. It's, it's, a, it's a separate issue. It's, it's that if you have a little bit of kidney function, it's better to, um, it, sorry, if you want to do peritoneal dialysis, it's better to have a little bit of kidney function left. 
Yes. My dialysis nurse has told me that actually hemo does make the kidney, um, it does affect it a lot faster than the kidney. Yes, yes. And they have done studies on it there, and uh, they, they, they said something about with the blood pressure dropping too much when right. they remove the fluid. So the question. I'm sorry. The question is about hemodialysis and the effect that it has on their remaining kidney function. So yes, if you have a little bit of kidney function left, you can study that and you can, pay, push in, you can put patients on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis and see what happens to that remaining bit of kidney function. And yes, because hemodialysis is, a, is for your body a very aggressive therapy, you are on a machine for three hours out of 24 and you do that every other day. And that, that three hours has to do everything in the 48 hour time window to clean your, clean your body. It is aggressive for your body and your blood pressure can fall a little bit and that small fall will have an effect on those few remaining nephrons that you have and eventually that little bit of kidney function you have left will go to nothing. Um, the flip side of that is that there is no measurable difference in the outcome of a patient that has a little bit of kidney function left and is on hemodialysis versus a patient that has hemodialysis and has a lot of kidney function left. Because yes, there are, you make a little bit of urine, you can be a little bit more liberal with your salt intake or your potassium intake, but not by much. But real clinical measures that they measure in large clinical studies are not affected by that. So that's why that is not, does not play into the equation of um, whether hemodialysis, um, you know, the good things about controlling and, and to um, the treatments of hemodialysis and how you, how you treat a patient. But it does, you can measure that slight change but it doesn't end up having a very meaningful clinical outcome. I don't know if that helped. What's your question? Yes? Kidney, you said kidney function remaining, that means passing urine, is that what, how to know the kidney? No, or no, no, no. Some, um, some other test. You can have absolutely poor kidney function and still make two to three liters of urine in a day. The, number, the amount of urine that you have does not correlate at all with the amount of kidney function that you have left. So what, um, um, what she was talking about was measuring the actual amount of kidney function you have left and being able to measure that over the time of hemodialysis. That's a, that's a different thing entirely. So I'm sorry, there's one last question. I think that's our last question in the back. Yes? Uh, what do you think of, about a pers person who was on kidney dialysis three times a week, three hours a day, and then they reduce it to twice a week and two and a half hours? for diabetes or for any kind of kidney problem. Okay. So the question was about the frequency. They have, they have to be a diabetic. Right, so the frequency of hemodialysis. Um, as far as we know, in all the studies we've done, three hours, three times a week um, is, in nece is necessary to provide the adequate amount of cleaning of your blood um, to move forward. If you do less than that, people do worse. And if you do more than that, people don't necessarily do better. So that's where the three hours, three times a week come from. There are going to be rare exceptions. There are going to be people that have so many other complications of their kidney that they need to be on hemodialysis, but still make a little bit of urine and still have a little bit of kidney function left. Um, and they might be able to get away with not having to dialyze three times a week, being able to liberalize their salt intake and not have to come in for their third trial in the week. And so some people for convenience issues, for um, patient satisfaction issues, will only dialyze for two times a week for less than that. And they can get by on that, but it is not ideal therapy for hemodialysis. It is not ideal therapy for your body. Um, the best analogy that I can give to that is if you don't brush your teeth, right? We're all taught from a very young age, you have to brush your teeth twice a day, morning and night. If you don't brush your teeth one day, nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna wake up with a cavity the next morning. But if you don't brush your teeth, if you only brush your teeth once a day for two years, you'll wake up with a cavity in the morning. So that's the best analogy that I can give for, for that situation. That's why the three hours, three times a week is what's paid for by Medicare, but it's also what's settled on by dialysis experts because it's, it's enough to get, um, to maintain your nutritional status. Um, and any less than that usually um, is, leads to a poor outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bala. Sure.